said in one, it wouldn't work. But in two, it wouldn't work. And so we went with plan B. And uh, thank God for IQs. <laughs> but that also put her at a bad disadvantage. She didn't get the practice, and that could have been an entirely different arrangement for what she had been using. Third week in this morning with the book of Matthew. We're going to look at the 21st chapter. We're only about seven days, a little less than seven days, away from the day that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And uh, I still believe that the day that Jesus rose from the grave was the greatest day in the world. Uh, we, Christmas gets a lot of hype for Jesus' birth. But let me just remind you that being born doesn't really accomplish anything, even if it is the miraculous birth that Jesus uh, went through. It was his suffering, bleeding, dying, and rising again that sets all of us free. <coughs> through his precious blood. Today they celebrate, or we celebrate, as Palm Sunday. And in your Bibles, you probably have a, a note right above uh, uh, the 24th chapter. Most Bibles will have a, a note there that says the triumphal entry. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He's coming for one reason. And that is to die a death on the cross. Jesus comes to Jerusalem and he kind of reminds me of an old western. How many likes westerns? All right. You'll know that, you'll remember that most westerns had a gunfight scene, didn't they? Where uh, the sheriff or, or the good guy would take on the bad guy. And they would walk out in, in that street. Their spurs, I wish they had some spurs so I could click them this morning. But they would walk out on, on the street, their spurs are clicking, and their guns at their side. And you would almost always see the little, they had a little uh, uh, piece of rawhide that covered the trigger. I guess that's to hold the gun in. Covered the hammer. That's right, not the trigger. Covered the hammer. Uh, and I guess that was to hold that gun in, in the holster. And you'd see, you'd see them pull that thing off. And you'd know they were ready for business. And they would get out in the, in the street and, and they would walk toward each other. Well, James, there's no way in the world that I would walk toward somebody that had a gun. And I'm going I'm to show my uh, real feathers and go the opposite direction. But they were... They would, uh, would walk down the street until they, they got whatever the respectable distance is. And somebody had to make the first play. And nobody ran. They stood their ground. Jesus Christ, on, as he made the entry into Jerusalem, stood his ground. There wasn't any denial that he had courage to accomplish what God has said him to accomplish. <clears throat> the Bible records in, uh, I believe it's the second verse, and we're not going to, our, our verse is the third verse, if we're going to look at that. I, I'm, yeah, the third verse. In the second verse, Jesus tells uh, two of the disciples, I've got a, a job for you. Inside Jerusalem, there is a place that has a, a donkey and a young colt. I want you to go and get them. That's horse thieving, isn't it? That's horse thieving. Jesus told the disciples to go and get them. I like what he says in verse 3. 
This to me shows not only his courage, but the fact that God owns everything. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord. Now I want you to remember that for just a minute. I want you to remember that word Lord and what it's saying. The Lord has need of them. And he goes on to say that, and, and immediately he will send them. There won't be any argument. There won't be any asking for money. There won't be any horse dealing. Jesus said, when you tell them the Lord has need of them, he'll give them to you immediately. Folks, the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem on the last week of his earthly life was a very emotional demonstration. There were a lot of people that lined the, the, the way there. The, uh, in Jerusalem, the crowds had assembled for the Passover. And so there was a large crowd there in Jerusalem. And the crowds were kind of keyed up with the expectation that God would raise up a king to deliver them from the power of Rome. That's what they were looking for that day. They were looking for a king that would earthly deliver them from the power of Rome. And shouts of Hosanna fill, probably filled the air as the crowd acclaimed Jesus as king. But there was one problem. The king came riding not only, not as an earthly king on a white horse. You know, the hero of all the westerns and, and all of the, uh, the stories that included horses always pretty much had a white horse or a golden horse. But this king didn't come riding on a white horse. He came riding on a lowly dog. And the people who lined the streets just didn't understand. And their tone probably changed when they saw what they saw and it didn't match what they had perceived. Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. As the onlookers, both people of faith and his enemies, watched. The expectations of that day was that God was going to have to raise up an earthly king that would go in and take care of the Romans forever. They wouldn't be a problem anymore. But Jesus rode in on a donkey. Here is God's Son riding on a donkey. Folks, things are not always what they seem when you deal with God. Our expectations are not always what God is going to lay out for you. And we need to keep in mind some things as we look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. I want you to see two things out of that verse of Scripture. I, number one, I want you to see that Jesus was courageous. I want you to also see that not only did Jesus uh, uh, tell his disciples to go and, uh, and get the donkey and the coat, and if someone questions you, say this, the Lord has need of them. Folks, I want you to understand and I want you to be mindful of the fact that the Lord has need of you. 
As we look at the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, we need to marvel at Jesus' courage. It took a lot of courage for him to do what he did. Jesus publicly <coughs> entered the city of Jerusalem <coughs> that was a hostile city. It was hostile because, number one, what was being preached wasn't the, the going thing in Jerusalem at that time. Number two, the people of Jerusalem that, that were, were natives of Jerusalem, that were the Jews, <coughs> were expecting God to, to send a, a king of king and lord of lords riding on a white horse carrying a spear and annihilating all of their enemies in one and when it didn't happen, that made the Jews even hostile to Jesus. What in the world is this man going to do riding on a donkey? What's he going, what possible things could he do? He has no weapons, he has no army, he has nothing that, that will liberate us from our oppression. Well, Jesus publicly entered into that city, that hostile city. And every eye was on him, including the eyes of his enemies. They were looking for things of weaknesses. You ever sized anybody up? I've been told that most people draw an opinion of some other person when they, they first meet them within a, just a few seconds. Y'all ever done that? What do you do when you first meet someone? Most of us will look, look them in the eye and you'll look straight down. If you've been in the military, you know that uh, the first thing that they usually look at is, their, is of course, the, the, the uniform is everything right, but they'll look at their shoes. I've been told that, that you can tell a lot by a person's shoes. Are they shiny? Are they beat up? Are they appropriate for, uh, for the, the, the event that, that's taking place? We size up people and make snap, snap judgments about how, how a person is in just a split second. In fact, we even get to the point where we know whether we're going to like them or dislike them in that split second. All the eyes of Jerusalem was on Jesus. His enemies were looking for, for things to, uh, for weaknesses that they could exploit. The Jews were looking for something that they didn't find in Jesus. We need to look at, when we look at his uh, entry into Jerusalem, we marvel at Jesus' open claim for himself. You remember that word Lord in the third verse? Is it still up there? Yeah. <laughs> See that word, the Lord? This was one of the first times that Jesus allowed the multitude to, to really recognize him as God's Messiah. The Lord has been. To be Lord of all and to be Savior of the world, he traveled the road that would lead to the cross. He had no intention of being the king that the Jews wanted. He had no intention of being an earthly king. His intention was to go into Jerusalem, to face the, the crowds, to face his, uh, his enemies to face those that would, would put him on, ultimately put him on the cross, those that would bury him, but he came there knowing that everything that God had planned was about to work out, and the next Sunday, or the, or the few days later, he would rise again. That's what he came for. He came to be Lord of the world, Lord of, uh, and Messiah, the Savior, not a king. How on earth did he? And in this, this time of venturing into Jerusalem, he let it be known who he was. We also need to marvel at Jesus' tears. 
There's really not a lot said about Jesus and his emotions. But we know he had emotions simply because he became human. Don't you have emotions? You get mad, you get happy. You shed tears, sometimes tears of joy, sometimes tears of despair, the heartbreak. I'm sure Jesus also shed tears. And Jesus overlooked his, that beloved city of Jerusalem and saw a lot of things. He saw poverty. Now, you know there are two types of poverty, don't you? There's poverty when you haven't got any much on this old earth. And there's spiritual poverty when you haven't got anything in heaven. Jesus overlooked that city and saw they had poverty. They saw, also saw that it was very materialistic. We're becoming very materialistic in this day and age. Everything is, is, uh, is about obtaining more and more stuff. And every one of us fuss because we have a lot of stuff stuffed in, in storage buildings and, and they're full to the brim. You know, I, I, I find it uh, uh, amazing that most people that have two-car garages can't get their cars in. Y'all have that car? We have a lot of materialistic things. The things that are going on in our society today are, are, are mostly materialistic problems. They're not spiritual problems, they're materialistic problems. He also overlooked Jerusalem and saw its empty religion. He also saw that they, they practiced, their practices were empty. There's a lot of empty religions in our world today. You know, religion is a bad name. Sometimes religion uh, conjures up at the attitudes of, of a church. If I come to church, I'm okay. If you come to church, you're on your way to being okay if you'll just listen to what's said and respond to the call of the Holy Spirit on your life. But coming to church doesn't make you okay. Being religious doesn't make you okay. A lot of the people that put Jesus Christ on the cross were religious men and women. Those that yelled out, crucify him, crucify him, were religious men and women. There have been a lot of atrocities done, even in our, in our United States, on the basis of religion. If you're going to be anything, be a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw a lot of unbelief. Folks, there's a lot of there was a lot of unbelief in Jerusalem. There's a lot of unbelief in our society today. People flock to do this and do that. We have people who are starving to death. And in our state, we're, we're fighting over whether, uh, whether grocery stores can sell wine.
understand that under the new health care thing, that if you are a smoker, you're going to pay as much as 50% more for your insurance if you drink, if you if you smoke tobacco. But on the other hand, you can go out and get tipsy, you can go out and get drunk, you can, you can have, have the biggest party in you can get on the interstate and drive in the wrong direction, kill 3,000 people in a pile up, and you won't hear a word about increasing your premiums. I think we've got our, I think our society's priorities are messed up. I really do. And I'm just using that as an example. There are a thousand other things that you could use as examples as well. And we do these things because we don't believe that God is going to intervene sometime. We're just like Jerusalem, just like Israel was. We're studying Ezekiel. Jerusalem, uh, Israel finally brought God to the point that, that He just made a, a just wiped them out for all intents and purposes. A lot of unbelief in our society today, just as it was in Jesus. And Jesus wept over that unbelief in, in that city of Jerusalem. He saw and hated the bitterness of those who plotted his death. He knew what was coming. He knew who was doing it. Oh, by the way, he knew that back years ago. Who, who would do it? It wasn't any, anything. He saw the hard rejection of his spiritual claims by, by the multitude. People's hearts were hardened. Satan hardened your heart. Did you know that? It gets so hard that nothing can penetrate it. He saw the impending doom that hung over the city. God was going to, to uh, God was going to intervene. He saw multitudes of people as sheep without a shepherd. And he wept. Because he knew that they were going to face judgment. The judgment of God. Mm -hmm. When we look at his entry into Jerusalem, we need to marvel at Jesus' loneliness. How did he get there? He didn't come in a Rolls Royce. <coughs> did y'all, did you have, did you watch the, the Pope, the outgoing Pope leave? Did you see what he left in? A multi-million dollar helicopter. And they probably had two or three others following behind him with the video cameras. Our president, and I'm not picking on him, I'm just saying any president, if you were president, you would get it too. They load up his car, they load up the cars of the Secret Service, and they fly those cars to wherever he's going. And then they get more cars from the local law enforcement, and they, and they have a big procession. Now the car the president rides in is not cheap. It's bulletproof, fireproof, bombproof, waterproof, won't shrink, has a good housekeeping seal of approval. <laughs> and you can't go down to uh, Carnival Kia or what it is now and, and get it for $99 a day. There's no telling what that car costs. And the odds are there's more than one car. There's probably several of those cars. <laughs> and the president rides around. I've heard that when, when the president, I don't know whether this is true or not, I've heard when the president takes office, they take his driver's license away from him. And he's chauffeured everywhere he does. I guess that's to keep you from leaving out in the middle of the night and see the church not know about it. I'm saying this to say, to let you understand. <coughs> that Jesus didn't come in pomp and circumstances. He didn't want the the notoriety that, that came that day. He 
came riding on the dog. And the people were too blind to see that his kingdom is not of this world, it's the spiritual kingdom. His victory comes not through war, but through peace. He wants to teach us that whatever he touched, he did divide. And no matter how despised the object is, no matter how despised the person is, when Jesus touches them, he changes all of that and Christ has a use for them. And this becomes very evident when we remember some things. We remember that God uses average, ordinary, and dedicated people. <coughs> Here's a little trivia you might want to remember. There wasn't a highly educated man among the original disciples. Think about that for a minute. None of the disciples had a doctor of ministry degree. None of this, the disciples had any experience. They were men with weaknesses and flaws just like the rest of us. Someone has, has said that some of them even had a fiery I guess fiery means a temper. Don't you get this? Anybody in this room? Don't hold it again. I don't want to know. You got a temper. <laughs> they had a bad habit of doing one thing that you and I do. They stumbled and fell. Yet Jesus took these obscure men and, and through them turned the world upside down. Men who, who had tempers, men who would stumble and fall, men who had weaknesses, Jesus used them to turn this world upside down. Folks, Christ will work with anyone who will give him a consecrated heart. In other words, Christ will work with anyone who will turn their life over to him. Jesus has need of you. More so now than at any other time in history. Jesus has need of you. Not only do we need Christ, but Christ needs us. Why do you think he calls us through the Holy Spirit? Jesus has no hands. But our hands do his deeds of kindness and mercy. As Jesus leads us, as God leads us, as the Holy Spirit leads us, we minister to people. He has no feet, but our feet do his errands of world mission. He has no tongue, but our tongues proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Folks, you may feel that you don't have a lot to offer, but you do. The Lord has need of you. <clears throat> and when you get in, that, in your mind you, that you don't have much to offer, let me remember, let me remind you of this. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to be perfect to be a child of God. What it does ask is this. That you give the best you have. The best you have. Not the leftovers. But the best you have. God doesn't require you to succeed. 
Because a lot of times your ministry won't succeed. But he does require that you be faithful. <coughs> Can you be faithful? Jesus was faithful. When Jesus walked to that point as, and, began, and began his entrance into Jerusalem and, and, and uh, mounted that donkey, he was being faithful to God. When he walked, when he went down that street, you know, I, I use the adage of, of a gunfire. Well, in all of the movies, who usually wins? The good guy. Well, there for a moment, it looked like that the bad guys had won. What they do? They put Jesus on trial, they put a crown of thorns, and nailed him to the cross. They, they crucified him. They stuck a spear in his side. His blood, blood ran out. And the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. He gave up the spear. In layman's terms, he died on that cross. And you know the story. All of the people that were associated with him ran and hid because they thought that it was over. The, the, his enemy said, well, we're, we're done with this dude. And we'll never see him again. They took him off and buried him, put him in, in the tomb, and, and somebody on just a quirk, I guess, thought, said, well, somebody come and steal his body, we'll have to deal with that, let's seal this bad boy up, and, and put two guards there. But in the end, oh, that's next Sunday that we get to hear the end. God won. <coughs> God doesn't require success. He requires faithfulness. Folks, the Lord has need of you. He wants all of you right now and forever. He's not going to ask more than you can bear. He's not going to ask you to do things that you're not, are not equipped to do. And sometimes God equips you to do things that you wouldn't even think that you would be able to. But it all boils down to this. The Lord has need for you. Are you willing to answer his call? To service? But most of all, are you willing to answer his call to salvation? Through his precious blood. Father, thank you for your love and your mercy. And Father, I thank you for Jesus' courage. I thank you for Jesus' love he showed on the cross of Calvary. I thank you for his example of being faithful in all things. Heavenly Father, I pray today that we are faithful in all things. And I pray that this morning, Heavenly Father, that you would give us the courage that Jesus had as he approached Jerusalem that day. I pray that you would give us the courage to face the world that we live in, to overcome the, the shadows and the potholes and those things that Satan throws in front of us. Most of all, Heavenly Father, I hope that you, I pray that you will give us the courage to overcome sin. And that's through the blood of your precious Son, Jesus. I pray right now that the Holy Spirit is talking to those that need to accept Christ as their personal Savior. And I pray that, Heavenly Father, they'll listen. I also pray that, they, that we as Christians would listen as well. Renew our courage, renew our strength, renew our faith, renew our commitment. Help us to not worry about success, but just help us to be faithful. Father, I pray this morning as we sing this song that you'll work in our hearts and convict us of the things that we need to, to do to prove our relationship with you. That you'll give us the courage to act on. Father, bless us now as we sing this song of invitation. For we ask it all in Jesus' name.
you're here this morning and God has spoken to you, whether it's for salvation, whether it's for uh, service, whether it's to rededicate your life, or life, or whether it's just maybe to come and pray. You feel that God is leading you, the Holy Spirit is leading you this morning.